Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's lecture, um, hosted by myself, Marianne Marr, and presented by Larry Scallon, local and military historian, recently retired commandant of the Irish Defence Forces based in Stevens Barracks in Kilkenny for many years. Most of you on tonight may have seen Larry's previous lecture from, bu from Bugle called Tolling Bell, presented in April of this year, as well as, as well as Dominic Price's lecture, World War I Veterans Experiences in Ireland, plus two lectures on the history of the ex-servicemen's costages. First one on the costages in Callan, presented by myself, and of the costages in Northern Ireland, hosted by <clears throat> Nigel Henderson from History Hub Ulster. All these lectures are interwoven into, with tonight's lecture. While this presentation is somewhat free-flowing and put together in a very short time frame, we hope you will enjoy it. And if you have any comments or questions to ask, please feel free to add them to the comments section below and I will bring them to Larry, either as we go along or at the end of the session. So as I hand proceedings over to Larry, I just open things with a question. Tonight's lecture is called Remembering to Remember. So what is the significance of such a title? Thanks, Marianne. Today is the 102nd uh, anniversary of Armistice Day. The guns stopped firing on the 11th of the 11th, 1918. The technic at that time, it was thought that was the uh, war to end all wars. Today is also a very important centenary event because it is the, the 100th anniversary of the burial of the unknown soldier in Westminster, uh, which has become, which became very quickly and was then a focal point for British expression of loss and uh, somewhere to visit uh, if you had no grave of your own to visit. Uh, even today, it has become embedded in British consciousness. Uh, in fact, most of the royal family, when they get married, the floral wreath or the, the bouquet that they carry getting married is laid at the tomb of the unknown soldier. Also today is the centenary of the unveiling of the cenotaph in the UK, which became again a focal point for commemoration and remembrance. So you, the recurring theme of tonight's discussion really is remembering. Re, so that's why it's remembering to remember. So the 11th, the, the 11th uh, Armistice Day is all about remembrance. Uh, but remembrance is not unique to uh, the loss in the Great War or, or indeed it's not uniquely British. The Sunday nearest to the 11th of July is the date uh, uh, which signifies the Irish National Day of Commemoration. Uh, it, the date is very significant because it's the date that the truce was signed in the Anglo-Irish War. Uh, it was a very contentious thing for a, a National Day of Commemoration in Ireland, but in the mid-1980s, 1984 in fact, uh, it was decided to form a committee and see what they could do. And from 1986, the National Day of Commemoration has been held in the Royal Hospital in Kilmainham, except for a couple of occasions. And that date is to commemorate all Irish women and Irish men who died in past wars or on service with the United Nations. So that is, in fact, the Irish National Day of Commemoration and Remembrance. That day is preceded 24 hours earlier by the annual ceremony of remembrance in the uh, National the guard the Rem remembrance garden in Island Bridge, uh, and that event commemorates those who lost their lives in two world wars, in particular the sixty to eighty thousand plus Irish men and women from the thirty two counties who died in both world wars. Uh, and I should say at this point, right, the National Day of Commemoration held on the Sunday closest to the eleventh of July is one of only four days where the Taoiseach's office dictates that government buildings should fly the Irish national flag from their buildings. The other three days are Easter Sunday, Easter Monday, and St. Patrick's Day. So the National Day of Commemoration is in maximum high esteem in Ireland, just to give a uh, context to commemoration. Remembrance Sunday, which uh, is, is the second Sunday in November, uh, has been on that Sunday uh, really since 
the start of the Second World War, but officially since 1956. Armistice Day was no longer commemorated on the 11th per se from 1939 onwards, because if it was during a weekday, it would have impacted on the ability of uh, industry to produce weapons and foodstuffs to support the Second World War effort. So the most, so the, the remembrance part of it was moved until the second Sunday, and officially from 1956, as I've said. Uh, but Armistice Day is still the 11th of November, and you couldn't have a national day of remembrance in the UK commemorating both world wars, really, or more than that, actually, because I'll talk about it in a second, because it would have significantly been biased towards the First World War. So, the, so Remembrance Sunday in the UK, uh, it is the UK government's British service members. It's to commemorate British service members who have died in war or conflict since the onset of World War I. And again, it's the second Sunday in November. And that can become a little bit contentious in the Irish setting, because if you're commemorating all wars or, or, or loss of life in conflict post the First World War, you are also commemorating uh, uh, guys and ladies who fought on the Crown side during our War of Independence. So that causes, uh, or did cause in the past, a little bit of contentiousness that, you know, it took a century and the, the hard work of uh, the diplomatic communities and, and uh, a royal visit and a president's visits to UK to, to help to, to soften uh, and to remove the context of, of that, even though obviously it still exists. And the blooming uh, poppy became to symbolize uh, Remembrance Sunday and the lead up to Remembrance Sunday uh, post actually in 1921, the Royal British Legion, which had just been formed from an amalgamation of previously existing smaller organizations which tried to represent veterans of the Great War and enhance their uh, pensions and enhance their rights and entitlements. But it was felt that uh, one umbrella organization would have much more effect. Subsequently, the Royal British Legion uh, was formed and they quickly uh, used the poppy to symbolize the sacrifice of the Great War, taking it on, in fact, from a French lady who brought it to a peace conference in, New York, in America. And, 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 and in that first year, they sold in excess of 8 million poppies. So it very quickly became the main fundraising capability for to look after veterans of the Great War. And, and it was a, 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 became an important part subsequently of the Royal British Legion's uh, uh, monetary stream, I suppose, for want of a better word. But the wearing of the poppy on Armistice Day, for me specifically, symbolizes uh, the loss of a great war person. But if you're uh, wearing it from, say, the 2nd of November right through till after Armistice Day, has a slightly different uh, connotation for me because it's more, you're more commemorating all UK servicemen who, who fought and died in World War One, World War Two, and any other conflict that they participated in. So like there's a nuance there, you either accept it for what it is and wear your poppy on, on Armistice Day, or some people are, are, it's becoming more acceptable in Ireland to wear your poppy, but it's still the connotation for most people in Ireland is World War One remembrance, as opposed to some people, Second World War remembrance, but as the conflicts get further uh, removed from that period, like the Falklands and, 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 and other conflicts, it becomes a bit more different and very difficult if you're talking about the War of Independence. The John McRae's poem, of course, uh, was uh, the instrument that it created the symbology around the poppy. Uh, and, uh, and if you read in Flanders Fields, you, you, you would get, you cannot, uh, you cannot get it, 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 it is, uh, uh, a very, very emotive poem. <clears throat> so I'm going to move on just a little bit to talk about I, I, what I call the anthropology of remembrance, right? Because uh, in my distant past, I was lucky enough to do a, a, a course of study in Minute, and uh, it was uh, the anthropology of sport is what it was. And I got thinking, right? And I studied the uh, 
sport in divided societies and, and the societies I picked were in Northern Ireland and South Africa. And of course, if you, if you said, well, I play field hockey in the North of Ireland, you're obviously, people will make an assumption or back when I studied it anyway, that you were from a specific uh, uh, religious background and even rugby to some extent back 20 or 30 years ago. Whereas if you played uh, Gaelic football or hurling, uh, it was much more likely that you were from a different tradition in the north of Ireland. Similarly, in South Africa, rugby was a predominantly white sport and uh, soccer, football uh, was, was uh, definitely more, more towards you know, the other population, the black population and so on. The, sim the anthropology of remembrance can be seen in a similar type vein for the purpose of this, because if I said to you, I, or if I, if I was wearing an Easter lily here now, you would say that I was, that, that I had a close connection with revolutionary Ireland. Whereas if I was wearing my poppy, which I have here, uh, my poppy is here somewhere, it's embedded in a shamrock, you would say, well, he's remembering them. We have managed to incorporate an Irish symbol with a poppy, which makes it easier to wear actually. Uh, uh, but if I was wearing the poppy from the 2nd of November on, you might say, well, I've, I'm supporting a different from a different tradition. So the anthropology, how we make up and uh, the, the remembrance, uh, bringing that into remembrance, you come from different uh, backgrounds and those backgrounds in the past could have been very well observed by anybody based on the, the type of uh, uh, floral or whatever you were wearing, the symbology of your wearing. And that brings me into the next small point. It's about the geography of memory. Uh, I suppose time and tide stop for no man. Our development of humans uh, uh, mean that we are, we have uh, over, over time, we've changed how we choose to remember. Most older existing great war memorials in Southern Ireland are characterized by the symbology of a religious effigy or something. There will be a cross in it. In fact, uh, if you look at the Care Great War Memorial, uh, which is one of the first in Ireland, early 1920s, from my memory, that that is very uh, much embedded in early Irish free state, national country, republic symbology. It has a cross and on it then it has uh, the geographical, the number rank name and regiment of the soldiers from the area. And that was great at bringing uh, what I like to call a memory trigger. Reading a name that you know is from your parish or your geographical area helps you trigger a memory. And that is the sole main outstanding purpose of memorials as for, for, uh, uh, for me. I'll just say, for uh, memorials, remember. Monuments, celebrate. There's a distinct difference between whether you see something as being a memorial or a monument. And, and it's a very distinct uh, difference for me. Uh, and they, they don't sit that well together. A monument would be, I, I, to pick one, uh, a very good one, a very good monument would be uh, the Parnell Monument in Dublin or, or, or uh, James Larkin. You're memorializing, you're, you're, you're making a monumental uh, symbol out of a person that was very influential in early, establishing an Irish early post-1920 uh, society in Ireland. One that I like as well, which is, is the Wellington Monument in, in the Phoenix Park. That's massive, it predominates the landscape in Dublin and it commemorates the most successful Irish general in the history of the British Empire, uh, the Duke of Wellington, Arthur Wellesley, who was born in Trimmon County Mead, uh, and, and he was born before the Act of Union, so he was definitely twice an Irish man, uh, if you want to get really technical about it. But uh, the older, uh, and, and that symbology of crosses was brought straight to uh, post-armistice Flanders and France, because the early Irish regimental uh, memorials mo or monuments, if you want to call them that, because they were celebrating the regiments, are like, for instance, the, 
the, the Mons Cross, the Celtic Cross, which is on a crossroads in Mons commemorating the Royal Irish Regiment. You have the Munster uh, Celtic Cross, which is in the town of Eve. You have, uh, you, you also have uh, the 16th Division uh, Memorial uh, Celtic Cross in, 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 uh, in Mazine. And you have the, the uh, another Irish Celtic Cross in Gillimont and Ginchy commemorating the actions of the, again, the 16th Irish Division. Uh, and these are all, if you go to Flanders and France today, you will be amazed and, and somewhat you know, surprised if it's your first visit uh, to see uh, very uh, overt Irish memorials from the start of the armistice or the commemoration space. And today, if you went there today, you will see lots of Irish tricolors flying around. And in fact, some of the museums actually by telling the story in a digital format now that they do have imposed Irish flags on a World War I battlefield to help you understand what was going on. So the Irishness of the Great War has become much more overt and that's about geography, it's about uh, uh, memory triggers. So, so a memorial and remembrance, memorial, a day like Armist Armistice Day, which is today, it triggers a memory, it, make, it makes memories, and it reconnects you with your geographical location. And that's when I talk about the geography of memory. Uh, uh, you will encounter very good examples of the geography of remembrance and memory if you visit the Wooden Bridge Great War Memorial in Wicklow. Wooden Bridge was where uh, the Cot Redmond's call was initiated, uh, and it was used uh, as county for by County Wicklow to uh, commemorate the Great War service of their count the people from Wicklow. It is beautiful. Uh, it it requires you to walk through the memorial because it's not one memorial. It's a number of different uh, vertical uh, stone uh, plaques which you read and you're drawn into it. So space becomes involved. You're walking through a beautiful setting. You you become. Uh, much more in tune with the, the commemoration feelings and it helps you to re-engage with your, with your history, with your past. Uh, and, and then the real good thing about Great War Memorials, and I'm going to specify a few single ones in a minute, is that it helps you to uh, uh, engage with the first thing I do, and I, 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 most people will be the same. You look for your own surname, your kinfolk, might never have been uh, rela related to you, but it's always something that you will be drawn to when you're looking at a Great War memorial. And it's, it's all about uh, the, the, the effect of the trigger, the, the memory triggers, the, the memory makers, and you make memories because uh, different memorials achieve that in different ways. Uh, and a memory uh, itself is not just a thought of the past. It's, a, it's something from the past brought into the present by you and you will bring it into your future. And that's why great war memorials that exist post, we'll say 1990-ish, uh, have all uh, become much more influential in how they trigger us to become emotionally attached to the 11th of November, particularly. Because it wasn't in our Irish consciousness up until, you know, uh, and I'll talk about in a minute the visit of Queen Elizabeth and Mary McAleese in 1998 and the unveiling of the Great War, the Island of Ireland Peace Park in Messine. But if you accept that uh, a memory has a past, a present and a future, well, then you will really understand how different Great War memorials have helped to bring the Armistice Day effect to their own geographical locations. I talk firstly about but the Ballingarry uh, War Memorial and Marianne was one of the driver, the main driver behind it, but they listed their servicemen by name and town's land. Right? So most people who are going to an area like Ballingarry are going to be there for a reason that they're from the geographical location or were from it or are visiting it. They'll see the memorial, they'll go read the surname, they'll say town's land. I think I know Murphy, is that Murphy? That's Murphy from the Commons, for instance. I don't, uh, oh yeah, I knew his, I knew somebody belonging to him. 
So there you're now triggering a memory, you're reconnecting, and you're actually turning it from a past thought into the present. And maybe you might mention that to the person the next time you meet him. God, I saw a Murphy on the, listed on the wall. Was that a relative of yours? And now you've brought something from the past right into the present, and you're bringing it into the future. So you've just me memory making, uh, and then you're going to reconnect with other people. So it, it, it's, it's a fantastic mechanism that has, in my opinion, uh, been advanced by the changed format of Great War Memorials from the late 80s and before it into the late 90s and the present time. And a lot of that is affected by people having pre-visited Flanders or France before they decided that they're going to uh, become involved in a committee to erect a memorial. And once you see the vast nature of the Menengate, Tietval Memorial, Le Touré Memorial, or you enter into a Tynecott Cemetery and there's 12,000 headstones, laying out like regimental soldiers in front of you. But not only that, there's tens of thousands more guys commemorated in that space by their name, their number, rank and name on a wall. And they're there because not one identifiable piece of their human remains were recovered during or after the war. So they couldn't be buried. So they are commemorated and remembered by being a uh, uh, engraved on a wall. So that's very important. And people bring that back then and they say, well, I don't want a small memorial in a, commemorating our, our uh, great war, uh, people who were lost in, in, in our geographical location. That in my sense is a sense that there's a, there has to be a, a form of uh, big is best when it comes to, because the sacrifice was so vast, you cannot, signify it is equally it is equally signifiable by a smaller memorial but people get uh, uh, immersed in it so much and for me uh, the war memorials work better when they're somewhat bigger and they contain more in personal information on a memorial engages people to trigger memories and that's the most important thing about a memorial uh, and I just mentioned the, the Ballingarry Memorial as it uh, uses Townsland, people's name and Townsland in order to reconnect, trigger and re-engage. Uh, the Wooden Bridge, uh, the geography of the Wooden Bridge Memorial is, is like going into a park. It's a meandering walk. It, br it, suck it brings you into its space. And uh, when you consider that the Wooden Bridge was, was a space that actually divided the Irish volunteers. They turned them, you either supported Redmond or you supported O'Neill. And yet that space now has become so inclusive that it's a, it's a real, if you're, when lockdown ends and you can go cross your borders, if you're lucky enough to live in Wicklow, it's well worth a visit just to get out for a day. Uh, uh, the wooden bridge in Wicklow actually was a built uh, and, and opened in, in, uh, in 2014. The Ballangarry Memorial was opened in 2017. The, the War Memorial Gardens in Island Bridge, they were started in the 20s, but they weren't actually completely reopened. They were let fall into disrepair. They were attacked by the IRA in 1956. Uh, bombs were planted and, and parts of the commemoration space uh, were, were destroyed. Lutyens, who was a famous British designer, did a fantastic job on the the War, National War Memorial Gardens in Dublin. It, it is a space within a city centre, uh, opposite on the opposite side of the River Liffey to the Phoenix Park, and it is superb. If you can visit the National War Memorial Gardens while the roses are in bloom in July, you will be so enhanced by the feeling of of uh, reflection and commemoration, especially with the with the water, with the fountains going in the background, just go and sit there and, and reflect for half an hour sometime. It would do your mental health good. Care, care is one of the older ones and it manages to capture space, time and commemoration. 
Mayo. Mayo was a, a 2010. This was this Mayo was a pathfinder. Mayo was a pushing the boundaries back in the day. It was a cross-border collab collaboration. It involved uh, people taking a big risk and a big chance on building what I would call a, a monumental memorial. It is huge in its size and it commemorates uh, soldiers uh, from Mayo uh, by regiment and, and by separate memorials. And uh, if you ever get a chance again, if you're up that neck of the woods, uh, you should try and visit. But it achieves uh, its uh, memory triggers in a in a sort of big way, whereas uh, uh, so, like Ballingarry achieves it slightly differently in that it's a it's a fine big memorial, but the Ballingarry uh, achieving of memory triggers is done by geographic connecting their soldiers with a location. Uh, the Kilkenny Great War Memorial is another excellent representation of of uh, memorials in the in the modern sense. It was unveiled in 2018, and it achieves uh, its 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 uh, desired end state by not only by uh, listing soldiers by number, rank, name, and regiment and age. So it gives you an opportunity to reflect on how are they so young. It triggers you to engage with the loss in the Great War. And, and in fact, Ireland's youngest service person to die during the Great War is recorded on that memorial. And uh, his name is Thomas Woodgate. He was 14. He was a Royal Air Force uh, second private mechanic, apprentice mechanic. And he was lost uh, during a torpedo attack in 1918 while they were crossing from Ireland to the UK for training. On H, uh, HMS Leinster, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and, but the Kilkenny Memorial, like the Carlow Memorial, which I'm going to talk about now, which is a slightly older one, and the Carlow Memorial is in Lachlan Bridge, and it is almost a miniature Menin Gate. And both the Kilkenny Great War Memorial and the Lachlan Bridge Carlow War Memorial share something which is vital to me, and that's the passing of a river within 10 yards of the memorial. Rivers, if you think back to early 20th century, young teenage uh, or 20 year olds, uh, what did they do for enjoyment? There was no PlayStations, obviously. We don't, like we're taught, like they, they were active in their geographical location. Rivers were a focal point for, for early 20th century uh, enjoyment, social activity, fishing, all that stuff, eating, staying alive. Food and the passing river, there's something about flowing water that engages your subconscious mind to reflect on uh, the sadness of the loss of all these people that you're reading. So, if you're sitting down in Lachlan Bridge and looking at the memorial, the constant in the background, and it's the very same in the Kilkenny Great War Memorial, the constant in the background is the noise of the river. It's either gurgling slowly or it's moving fastly or it's meandering depending on the season, depending on the, 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 the water that's in the river, but it's constant and it's always there. And one thing that always engages me in Kilkenny particularly is that the bell that rings the quarter hour and the hour is the same bell that rang the quarter hour and the hour in 1914 and 1918. So the guys, when they were standing up to their hips and muck, and water in a trench in the present moment, looking out at no man's land, weren't thinking I'm in a trench up to my knees or at waist in water in no man's land. They were thinking in their conscious mind, I'm in Kilkenny, I'm sitting on the banks of the River Nore, I'm fishing and I'm having a great day because their present was too unimaginable that they had to remove themselves from their and where else would they think about only a city like Kilkenny or a town like Ballingarry or Cair or Mayo or, or, you know, Dublin or whatever part of the geographical area we're from. But geography, the geography of memorials becomes very significant. And, and the development of that geography might have been accidental. I don't know. You might disagree with me, 
and that's fine. I'm used to being disagreed with every day. Uh, uh, but uh, I would suggest that subconsciously, a lot of, oh, when we reflect on it now, it, it, it makes sense. And when we talk about Armistice Day, the, the 11th of November, uh, 2020, and we reflect on, in, in, in my case, you know, uh, two ancestors that died in the Great War, and everybody has their private story. But the thing was, one of my ancestors, the family had completely forgotten him in history because my grandmother, unfortunately, had passed away before uh, I could talk to her about him. But my auntie had vague memories of her mother, my granny, talking to her about uh, Private John Redmond, uh, who was uh, no relation to the, the John Redmond of the Irish Parliamentary Party. Uh, but, uh, you know, so, so, so that, that was forgotten because the post-1918, post-1921, New Ireland, right, uh, commemoration events still significantly happen, right up until the early 1930s. Then the subversive nature or the revolutionary nature of an emerging Irish identity meant that those events were targeted by guys who disagreed with the symbology of it. So like if you could, if you were trying to have a new independent uh, Irish state country free from the trappings of a pre-1922 empire, a part of the United Kingdom, that it didn't fit. A and B didn't make C. You had to get rid of the B. A was going to lead you to a fresh new looking Ireland, but we couldn't have the trappings of this old colonial Ireland, uh, Pre, uh, subserv subservient Ireland, uh, which existed in pre-1901 until 1922. But, but and, and that's okay. Like, you have to accept, accept that because we wouldn't be who we are now if we hadn't come through that process. But post-1998, and I bring it to 1998, uh, well, in 1993, you had uh, President Mary Robinson attending uh, Remembrance Sunday events. And then you had uh, President Mary McAleese continuing it, uh, the, the visit of Queen Elizabeth uh, uh, and the laying of wreaths in the, in, in the gardens. And, you know, in, it, it was very significant. Uh, and, and then the unveiling of the Mazine Ridge, uh, Ireland of Ireland Peace Park, which was a 32 county, a 32 county park commemorating all soldiers and sailors and well, actually, uh, if you go in there, it more or less commemorates the 10th, the 16th, and the 36th Ulster Division, the 10th Irish Division, the 16th Irish Division, and the 36th Ulster Division. There are the symbol, the single uh, wall-mounted memorials in there, but really it commemorates all uh, soldiers and sailors and nurses and, 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 and anybody that lost their lives in the Great War, even... Uh, working in munitions factories at home for me it's just a fantastic place uh, to go on and and walk around uh, a modern but historical looking uh, round tower and you cannot but become uh, immersed in uh, the remembrance aspect of it so as we today remember to remember uh, and as we reflect on remembrance in ireland a developing remembrance in Ireland from the time of the end of the Great War uh, right through to today, tonight. Uh, I, I would like to, you know, uh, say that uh, we have matured. We can now wear our symbol for a single day or you can wear it for a week. It means slightly different things, uh, but that's OK. Uh, and you can say, but the other thing is in the culture, in the culture in the UK is that if you're not wearing the symbol of a poppy, you're somewhat disloyal. And that's kind of wrong too, because it has to be personal choice. And you can't uh, uh, target somebody because it's his belief that he doesn't want to wear it because it symbolizes something that he doesn't necessarily agree with. Well, you should accept that. And you know, the social media stuff that goes on about some of the soccer players who won't wear the poppy for their own personal reason. If you was to wear an Easter lily, would, would, people, would, would people be critical about that next Easter? Oh, you bet they would. 
but sh you, you have to accept that in a multicultural society, and we are a maturing nation in Ireland, happy Europeans, or at least I am very happy European, uh, and embracing, embracing uh, all the, 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 the future has to bring us. You have to uh, pause on the 11th of November it's a great day for reflection and just sit back if it's only for 10 minutes. If you light a candle tonight for five minutes, uh, we have a very strong tradition in the Irish Defence Forces of remembering our deceased members on the 2nd of November. Uh, there's a deceased members mass. Unfortunately, it couldn't happen this year because of COVID. Uh, but it, it is a very uh, touching day because people whose, whose soldiers, uh, sons or wives or daughters or friends would have died 30 and 40 years ago. And they will religiously come into the deceased members mass because of the closeness it brings to people. So, you know, reflection is good. And, and uh, the, the use of Armistice Day on the 11th of the 11th uh, gives us a big opportunity to create, uh, I suppose, uh, friendship, human friendship, but it also gives us a very, strong sense of, of uh, well, we can't let another war happen. Now, one subsequently happened to the First World War, we all know that, but, but it should be a strong pointer for a reflection to say, we can't let that happen again. And if you can take nothing else from my half hour long, I won't, I, I won't call it a rant, but, but <laughs> chat with you tonight, just, memory triggers, uh, memory makers, and reconnecting with your past through, through physical visiting of geographical sites, which are World War commemorative spaces, can only enhance your life into the future. On that, Marianne, I'll hand you back and I'll say thank you very much for listening to me for the last just 40 minutes. Thanks. That was great, Larry, thank you very much. Um, we have a few questions, I'm sure there'll be more coming in as we uh, keep discussing. Um, the first one is from Mary Orford. Um, she's just saying, hi, Marianne. Remembering today my own ancestor, Eleanor Orford, a Thai County Kildare, who was a VAD at a military hospital in the UK. She contracted typhoid and died. Through the great work of the Thai Historical Society, she is now formally recognised by the Commonwealth uh, Grave Commission as one of the fallen. Um, are there many women from Ireland who are formally recognised? Do we know the answer to that? First of all, I would like to congratulate Atai on the unveiling of their own Great War Memorial. Uh, I think it was last year. It's a lovely space. It's a, a, a has a sense of memory trigger, definitely. It's a smaller uh, uh, plaque set in a sort of a uh, an open square, we call it a hollow square in the army, if there is such a thing. It's a three-sided, but this one is slightly, but it's, it leads you into it, uh, and it's very good at, 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 uh, at achieving its, uh, you know, desired end state for people to remember. There are lots and lots of women uh, who are commemorated. The Kilkenny Great War Memorial, Donald is there, and he might say, it. I think it's five or seven nurses that are commemorated on, on, on the Great War Memorial. Lots of the VADs, the Voluntary Aid Detachment Nurses, the Queen Alexander Imperial Nursing Service, the Red Cross Nurses, uh, were almost, they were the original frontline nurses. Uh, they may not have been in the trenches, but they were in the dressing stations not too far back. And, and, and lots of them, unfortunately, played the ultimate sacrifice by exposing themselves to disease, basically, by trying to cheat, treat soldiers. And I've read a few accounts where nurses, uh, not only would they try to nurture and help the soldiers recover, but one of their most important uh, functions uh, during, uh, while well, in hospitals, was actually to help a dying soldier to die peacefully. You know, to be somebody there, a friendly voice. Imagine that. That you know tonight that maybe you have no hope of saving somebody, but if you sit down and spend three minutes and that man, his last living memory is that there's a friendly voice here. So the, the, 
the 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 participation in women uh, generally in the Great War is is a subject for much more research, but it's great to see that they're now being commemorated. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Um, yeah, Donna's come back and just said it's five five women on the Kenny um, Great War Memorial. Um, we have Mark Doherty. He's just saying that he has visited the Care Memorial and was pleased to see a noble and well cared for installation respect for the dead he also recommends visiting the very beautiful constructed wicker memorial at wooden bridge it even includes roger casement um in these uh, in those remembered didn't know that actually yeah i actually used to know the gentleman that cared for the care memorial johnny was his first name i will think of his surname in a few minutes he was a veteran of the second world war and he looked after that memorial daily. He used to change the flowers, water the flowers for his entire life. Unfortunately, he's passed away a few years ago. I visited him in his little house on a hill in Cairo one time. And he, I had the honour of uh, him showing me his, uh, he was a Royal Irish Fusilier, uh, his uh, war service medals from the Second World War. And I think his father's medals and his Boer War medals from the Great War. Uh, it's, it's, care is lovely. And the setting is superb. Yes. And it's looked yeah. after like it's it was a living it's a living memory as well as looked after. Yeah. Um, Liam has a question. There are many families out there who might have a vague story of someone who fought in World War One. How would interested family members start tracing records uh, of these relatives? Duck. Well, <laughs> that's a big one. There, there are many. There are many uh, websites now that that will happily charge you for. Uh, for the for the privilege of research but uh the best thing i could say is if anybody would like to drop a note here uh, uh, for me or i'm sure yourself uh yeah. Yeah. happily to do that research because we have paid access to the websites that are out there a vague memory is good a surname is great if you have a service number fantastic the more information you have the easier it is to to uh to uh, uh get more it's easier to establish, to zone in, like the, the more vague your information is, the more you might get a thousand potentials, you know, the bit more of information is great, like an age or a date of birth. That's all good, good. Yeah. Uh, and Great War information is still being scanned and uploaded. Uh, the pension records, and you were telling me tonight, like in 1980, there were still 28,000 families. In 1980, there were 28, thousand families still drawing down world war one pensions in ireland that's phenomenal like to think that that far removed from the great war that there was a living descendant who still qualified for that pension and all those pension records are now available if you have access to the right uh, website yeah and local newspapers if people have access to library is a yep is a really good place to kind of start which yeah. you'd be actually surprised what you can actually find kind of free but um yeah unfortunately most of the records that you have to pay for them so like you said there's loads of people out there that are more than willing to yeah. to, to help research um donald's just well done larry uh always informative uh noel mcknight um thank you larry I know a, a, a Northern nationalist who lost ancestors and have had no issue going to the battlefields to remember them. Nothing West Brit about remembering your dead. Okay. No, no, but, but, but I, I get that. <laughs> and, 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 I, and I like that the West Brit connotation is like uh, you're living in Ireland, but you're still consider yourself British. And, yeah. and I get that. And, and, and that, that, that in, inference you know, for some people, it's still a little bit real, uh, and and uh, but for most of us, uh, it's completely Irish. Like I've brought seven or eight tours now to to Flanders, uh, and the Somme, and uh, you know, to uh, Verdun, and to other places involved in the Great War, and like uh, it, it's all been it's 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 your background, it's your history, it's your heritage, mm -hmm. and whether you're Irish or Spanish or Portuguese or Senegalese. Or British, American, uh, uh, French, Japanese, Russian, you all have some connection. Chinese, the labor force in, in the World War One, towards the end, anyway, 
was predominantly Chinese. The Chinese didn't actively fight, but they brought most of the ammunition to the front lines, you know, and there's a lot of Chinese buried in Flanders. You know, so the, like nationality or inferred nationality shouldn't be a crutch, I suppose, or something that, that uh, should be associated with you because you visit the Great War battlefield. It's not. Yeah. It's personal history, personal heritage. Yeah, it's even if you never had anyone connected with you in the war, yeah. actually drive through Flanders or, or France and see all those yeah. cemeteries, you know, all dotted along down in the fields and on the roadsides. Yeah. And it's 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 a total experience. Um, just on my own, like we've we've been looking at, I suppose, the memorials in Ireland for the kind of last couple for a few hours there today. And I suppose the surprising thing to come away from it was that there's only out of the 26 counties, we just take the Republic, there's only 10 counties that have a county memorial. Yeah. Um, Kilkenny, Kildare, Limerick, Longford, Waterford, Wexford, Wicklow, Carlow, Cork, and Dublin. Um, we have eight Ian, say, villages and towns that have. A memorial. Now, what I mean by is a community yeah. memorial. So we have four in Cork, two in Donegal, one in Dublin, two in Kildare, one in Kilkenny. I'm taking Callan and Kilkenny, two in Loud, one in Mead, and three in Tipperary, and one in Wicklow. And I suppose out of all, being from Tipperary myself, I suppose one surprising fact to come away for it is the fact that there's none in Clamell, considering. Yeah, well, you see, Tipperary uh, would have uh, was a depot uh, of the Royal Irish Regiment. Uh, it it was uh, a, a very there's there's thousands of uh, soldiers who fought in the Great War, Tipperary from Tipperary, uh, and uh, uh, it's it's probably I would imagine it's a job in somebody's mind at the moment, but uh, it's like these it's things the. The further we remove ourselves from centenaries, we're in our decade of centenary still, and the further we remove ourselves from the Great War centenary, and, and it moves like next year, two years' time will be the disbanding of the Irish regiments, uh, the centenary of that. Well, after that, then we're into it's going to be very hard to instill uh, the desire in the community to commemorate their Great War history and heritage. I'm not saying it won't happen, I'm just saying. The, the, the possibilities of funding and that sort of stuff will, will not be as good as it was in the past or into the short term future. You know, uh, the barracks in Clomel is the home of two uh, beautiful uh, war memorials of sorts, a Boer War Memorial to the Royal Irish Regiment and an Egyptian uh, a cross commemorating the war in Egypt of 1882, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and they're lovely and it's just, they, they will become part of the landscape of Tom again once that site is developed and let's hope that it's sooner rather than later. I would just mention that uh, I'm, I, I had written down here the uh, Callan Memorial to mention because uh, Callan doesn't, it has the Kings River, right? But they took a slightly, so uh, in Callan, the Great War Memorial is on the boundary wall of a church, which is brilliant, on a main street. So it is in, it has embedded itself in community in a different way. And the symbology, like the Kilkenny War Memorial of having uh, a life size or slightly smaller than life size statue of a soldier in arms reverse is very symbolic to remembrance because the last thing we do as soldiers when we're saying goodbye to somebody at a funeral is you arms reverse. Uh, in, in Ireland, and I, I gave the order too many times, a shumpig arm, or arm a shumpa lee. And that is a reflection of a soldier's sorrow. His head is bowed and his weapon is in the reverse mode. And that is the symbol of sorrow and goodbye. And, you know, we honor your you and your death and goodbye, you know? So, so like the symbology of the Callum Memorial is significant. Much the same as a Kilkenny uh, soldier in arms reverse. Yeah, um, just a comment here from Trevor Bland. She's just saying, just going back to our, the piece we said about the pensions, he said, he's yes, he's, his grandmother had a pension until she died in 1983. 
yeah. just, we've we've a lot of similar similar cases sure. like that. Yeah. Um, Maureen Kerrigan is just asking if there's any more memorials in Leitrim or Sligo. So I'm just having a quick look at my um, list here. There's none in Leitrim, but there's a memorial in the Sligo, um, in the cathedral in, in, in Sligo. It's a role of honour in the, in the cathedral. Yeah, most, uh, I would imagine that that's a Church of Ireland cathedral because most Church of Ireland uh, churches, and this is to their infinite credit, uh, as soon as the Great War was over, even some cases before it, they immortalised the names of their parish parishioners yeah. Uh, yeah. In, 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 in the form of plaques, wall-mounted mostly. In St. Canis Cathedral in, in Kilkenny, they're in the alcove in the entrance space. And uh, the amount of beautiful uh, stained glass windows throughout the Church of Ireland community it has to be recognised and, you know, Word, wordy of a lecture on their own, actually. Yeah, um, it was just interesting before we start this, I just had a quick look at some of the um, commemorations that was in 1919. And from what I could see, St. Peter and Paul's Church in Clamel was literally the only, now that's re recorded in the newspapers, was yeah. the only, say, Roman Catholic church that I could find that actually ha held a ceremony for for those and that's literally just a year after they commemor commemorate 300 men that had died from say the, the confines of, of Clamel like you know so it was just interesting to see that but I was sort of um say it's taking that list 19 out of the 26 counties have church memorials yeah. predominantly yeah. church church of Ireland with a few county crosses say on the grounds of some of the churches yeah. but on average yeah. it's um Church of Ireland. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, Margaret Dillon, thank you, thank you, Larry Marianne. Uh, Paul Campbell, he just attended the History Hub Ulster Zoom talk there. It was just on a half an hour or so before ours um, this evening. And it was mentioned that Manny actually died on the 11th of November 1918 after the ceasefire time of 11, 11 mm -hmm. a.m. Um, but obviously, that's more to do with the fact that the news had to filter down the yeah unfortunately there were a few attacks uh put in by uh less than i, I uh, i'm not gonna i'm not gonna i'm not gonna question your intelligence like but what was the point in going ahead with a planned attack at 9 a.m on the 11 to the 11 knowing that at 11 a.m the war is going to end silly uh but like there you go that's ancient history now but it doesn't you know lots of unnecessary deaths were caused at the end of the war and look at let's say you could make the point that they were all futile anyway yeah, yeah. um donald's just come back there just said that there's work in progress on a county memorial in sligo so they have they have a facebook page uh lest right. sligo forget and maureen's just back to say that she's been in the cathedral in sligo a couple of years back and she must have missed it thanks for a great talk so um yeah that's that's pretty much it um for tonight's lecture thanks very much as we said we we kind of pulled it together at the the, 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 the 11th hour as they say so um just to let everyone know that there's just two more uh, lectures coming up this week um tomorrow it's the bobby sands the man behind the headlines with christy moore and colin uh scullion and then friday um the tomb mother and baby home controversy is being hosted on Trasna and Atira. So this lecture will be uploaded on, on YouTube in the next day or so, so you can um, check out, or, and you can check this out again, or you can check out uh, past lectures on the Trasna and Atira channel, channel on uh, YouTube. So uh, we just wish to uh, express our thanks to Liam and the team and Trasna and Atira for facilitating tonight's lecture and thank um, you to everyone who has um tuned in tonight and uh on that note thanks again thanks again larry sorry to drag yeah. you into this in the no no pleasure <laughs> and i just wish everybody happy and peaceful i suppose armistice day is nearly over now but it's time to go off and reflect and maybe watch something on youtube to uh uh look at something about world war one anyway i could yeah. recommend it but if i start i'll be here for another half <laughs> very good all right thank you very much. thanks Goodbye, everybody thanks again everybody thank Bye. you thanks